Hey everybody, welcome to the Muckrake Podcast. I'm Jerry D.F. Sexton. I'm here with Nick Houseman. Nick, we're going to be hanging out in a couple days. I cannot wait to be uh, uh, on the road with you. I Well, I, are we technically, well, we're not technically going to be on the road. We're going to be on the road, dot, 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 together. You have to take a road to get there. Zach, I don't know, something. I was thinking of, uh, you know, Willie Nelson, you know, something. We'll but both be on the road and then we'll converge. Yes. So, and like, we're just going to be hanging out. We're going to watch some, like some, some NCAA basketball games. We're going to talk a lot. I'm assuming a lot of politics. That'd be very exciting. We're going to talk a ton of politics. We're going to be hanging out with listeners. I, 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 for one, am excited. Uh, so everybody, as we've been talking about, we are going to Henderson, Nevada for Pete Dominic's stand up jam, um, podcast jam, stand up podcast, podcast, stand up jam. I, I, I'm not good with words. Uh, jam, jam pot. I talk for a living. I talk for a living. I don't know why I do this. It, well, listen, if you're out there uh, and you're going to come, like, you know, tweet it out. Let us know. Tag us. Let us know. We want to, you know, see who's going to be there. And, and we're, be we're so looking forward to meeting some of our listeners. And, and we've already been hearing from a lot of people who are very excited about going to this thing. Uh, so Friday, March 22nd, we'll be getting into Henderson, Nevada. Uh, there are rumors of an event with me doing something like a bourbon talk. We'll see about that. If people are interested, feel free to reach out to me. On Saturday, March 23rd, Nick and I are going to do our first live around other people uh recording of the Mike Craig podcast i'm excited great way to characterize it live around other people live around other people in front of an audience that is going to be saturday march 23rd uh we'll have more information about the timing of that but because of it nick uh, we're going to be recording our regular Weekender episode on Saturday. So that means that the Weekender will not be coming out on Friday. It will be coming out on Saturday after we record it. Yes, we have to figure that one out, too. That'd be some interesting. Uh... We, we got to get all that stuff figured out. And then you and me are going to be hanging out with people, probably having a beer or two, bullshitting, watching NCAA tournament games. I'm I'm excited. I'm ready to go. Oh, I cannot wait. I need it. I could really use a nice little re- re- respite from uh, day-to-day activities of uh, me. Respite, 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 respite. I, which I is don't, oh, crap. I always thought it was respite. but it was Respite cool. sounds nice. Respite? I like respite. Uh, but if you want to gain access to that show, go over to patreon.com slash Podcast. As always, it supports the show, keeps us ad-free, editorially independent, and growing, which we are, and we thank everybody for that. Listen, everybody, we've got an old humdinger of an episode here today, and it begins with one Donald John Trump. Uh, Nick, he's up to it again. He, he's he's up to his old tricks, his old, his old tricks. As he's facing uh, mounting legal and economic jeopardies, uh, Donald Trump has started to uh, escalate his rhetoric, uh, which is something we told every, every we told everybody that he was going to do this. Now we're watching it at a rally in Vandalia, Ohio. Trump has said that uh, immigrants are not people; they are animals. And then the thing that has gotten all the headlines that you and I need to get into and have a larger discussion about. Uh, here you go. Listen and weep, folks. And you're not going to be able to sell those guys if I get elected. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. But they're not going to sell those cars. They're building massive factories. of. Okay. Okay, there we go. So there it is, the former president of the United States who attempted a coup uh, against the government of the United States after losing the presidential election of 2020 is saying that if he isn't elected, it's going to be a bloodbath. Nick, this has uh, been making all the rounds on social media. It's been in all the headlines, all of the stories and articles. I have my thoughts about this. Um, what What is your reaction to this? Well, I mean, you know, the part of my reaction is just to see the reaction on the right of all of this. And yep. they're really wringing their hands. They have their, their pants in a bunch. I don't know, whatever that term is. They are really upset about this. Um, and, you know, Trump's tries, you know, it's funny for a guy that's supposed to be with it and not suffering from any kind of, you know, uh, brain function issues. Uh, he, he has to walk back a lot of things. He has to explain a lot of things that he says over and over again. It's interesting. And this one's no, no, no different. He's trying to say that he was talking about the auto industry and UAW. And of course, remember, UAW is firmly with, with Biden, having had Biden walk with, you know, with them uh, on their during their strike. 
Um, and so I suppose he's trying to cleave off some of those people, which you know, he may or may not be able to do. But the, but to try and link that when clearly what I'm hearing, at least, is that there was a comma, a pause, a switch to a different subject to some degree in that adult brain of his. So I, I feel like he is trying to imply, or at least that's what everyone, the mainstream media people are trying to say, is that he's trying to imply that there will be, you know, blood in the streets if he doesn't win the election or he wants blood in the streets if he doesn't win. So, Nick, uh, before I get into how I feel about this clip and the coverage and discourse around it, how would you describe the general uh, tone of this podcast in response to Donald Trump over the past few years? The general tone would be, you know, uh, not positive, not positive, uh, critical. I would I would even say, w would you say that we have underplayed the threat of Donald Trump on this show? Um, I, 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 if all the things that we've said about him and all the things we've implied, even, uh, I don't think you could get that far uh, at all, uh, in terms of under has, has any show and has any duo in media and political commentary told people more often that Donald Trump is an existential threat to the United States. Has anybody even come all that close to us? I, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I remember when you even first started doing it before I was even on board with that and thought, and I was on that thinking that yeah, that's a little extreme, but within weeks, it became clear you were absolutely right. So with all that being said, let me say this. This whole thing uh, is actually really indicative of how our media and our political class deals with everything. He was talking about a bloodbath in terms of how the economy would work and what would happen to American cars if he wasn't elected. Basically, he was saying that the automobile industry would suffer if he wasn't elected president. Of course, everybody ran with that, saying that he said that there would basically be blood in the streets if he wasn't elected. As a result, this was a mischaracterization of what Trump was saying at the time. But here's a couple of caveats with that, Nick. Would it shock you to hear that Donald Trump has said explicitly before this moment that it would be a bloodbath if he wasn't elected president and he was speaking about blood in the streets? Would that surprise you? I, I would shocked would be not the word I'd use. Uh, it's definitely the opposite of that. What if I told you that he said this in 2016 and in 2020? I would say, of course. What if I told you that he had said this earlier in 2024? I would say I, I heard it too. This is part of his vocabulary. This is part of his rhetoric. The fact that it's just coming up now is more about the fact that people don't pay attention to the shit that he says. Mm -hmm. And it's just part of his normal vocabulary. That's what sucks about this, is that this got all of the headlines. In particular, Nick, do you know why? Because there's not a lot in the headlines right now. There is, in the past couple of weeks, the biggest story has been what has happened to Kate Middleton. And as a result, and, and right now we're getting ready to talk in a second about his financial trouble, but what happened here was this was cooked up in order to score people cheap retweets, uh, cheap uh, likes, page views, circulation, all that stuff. Donald Trump was actually just using his regular vocabulary when he said this multiple times already, and it's because people haven't taken this thing seriously for a very long time. I also want to point out that his entire vocabulary is constantly like this. He talks about there not being another election. He talks about American democracy being destroyed if he doesn't get elected. He talks about the end of America. He talks about the fact that the Second Amendment might be necessary to solve problems or people might go out in the streets and get angry and violent. Well, guess what? This is who he is. He raises the temperature constantly to the point where he's talking about the automobile industry. He's talking about a bloodbath. That is his rhetoric. That is how he talks about things. That's what he does to the environment. It just so happens in this case that it was just rhetoric or, that he usually uses in a way that other people hadn't heard before. Well, wait, is, is Kate Middleton okay? Well, we don't know. Do you not? Wait, time out. Anything about it. But you don't know. You don't wait. You don't. Wait, you, what? You don't know anything about this? I, I really, I, I, I think I was aware that somebody said something and maybe she was not feeling well? I don't know. I don't know. Well, she, she hasn't been, she hasn't been seen in months and there's been like weird doctored photos and strange things are happening. It's been like one of the most popular things on social media. That's wild. Oh, wow. I've been completely popular. But well, you, okay. But did you see what I did there? So you dropped the Kate Middleton thing, the little line that nothing and meaning nothing and what your whole point, which went on for another minute or two. And now you're off on the rabbit trail. Yeah. And that's what happens. Yeah. Right. And now, like, I don't remember anything you said about Trump just now. The entire that. point is that Donald Trump has done this for eight years. And not only has he said that there will be a bloodbath, Nick, there has been blood. People mm -hmm. have died. 
People have been uh, people have been assaulted. People have been murdered. People have been attacked. There's been bombs. There have been multiple assassination attempts. There's been assaults. There's been an I mean, people died during his coup attempt. I mean, like this is nothing new. This is simply the same thing, and it just keeps getting worse. There's this, been defamation. Yes, absolutely. And the entire point of it is that, and by the way, no one listening to this show, I mean, they heard this and they're like, yeah, this is old news. Of course it's old news. It's old news because it's been going on and people don't want to pay attention to it. And they're waking up and they're like, oh, I think there's something wrong with this Donald Trump guy. Well, no shit. There's something wrong with this Donald Trump guy. There's something really wrong with this Donald Trump guy. Is that the, are those the people that must be undecided at this point in 2024? <laughs> I think those are the people who have been decided, but they don't know why they've been decided. You know what I mean? Like it's it's like people who found out suddenly that global warming is a problem and they're like, whoa, 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 you're telling me that the earth is heating up and that there's like rising tides? Like somebody needs to do something about this. And that's what this is. It is just the most like, I, I don't know which one of the best examples of like the amnesiac culture that we have. It's it's incredible to me. Yeah. I mean, it, it, now you're reminding me of like, you know, we keep seeing people uh, and by the way, th there must be an ethical issue with uh, the people that go with the camera and the mic and they go to Trump rallies and they interview knowing that they're going to, you know, sort of set the interviewee up for sounding problematic. Right. And they, they love it and they get all the interaction. And I, I kind of just end up feeling sad for a lot of that those times because, sure, you know, you can see the the they all have a lot of passion. Right. About Trump. They all feel very strongly about wanting to vote for him but you t you try and get one sentence deeper into the whys and the where's and the thought process and it really devolves very quickly and it is sad it is sad to me it, it's not i'm not angry i'm not frustrated i just i just feel a, a sense of uh it's sadness but also probably just um the the it's futile to, to think that um you know you're ever going to try to reach anybody like that because of where they've gotten and how they process these things i feel infinitely sad about the state of america in general when it comes to this stuff i can't tell you how many segments we've done where we've looked at like the terminally confused american voter they have no idea what they're talking about everything is contradiction you know um it, it just continually goes uh down these roads where like it has nothing to do with like actual objective reality uh people have a uh, little grasp on this stuff it makes me sad in general yeah. And quite frankly, one of the things that makes me sad, but also pissed off, Nick, is watching stuff like this unfurl. Yes, you should take it seriously that a presidential candidate says bloodbath in every speech that he gives and is saying that immigrants aren't people. Nick, we've heard that before. Mm -hmm. We've heard him say before that immigrants aren't people, that they're animals, they're bad hombres, whatever it is that he wants to call them. Like he's been calling them poison and they're going to poison the blood since he came around. Like, it makes me so sad that we have an actual threat in this country and it's being treated like, 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 I don't know what's happening to Kate Middleton. You know what I mean? Like, 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 uh, like celebrity gossip. Like it's something to sort of be tuned in on every now and then, but not really pay that much attention to It's It's really sad to me. Well, the, 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 the dichotomy here would be something like, okay, uh, Joe Biden used the term illegal in the state of the union address yes. as an off the cup, off the, uh, you know, uh, the script comment and within what like two days he came out and he apologized right he understood you know i'm not supposed to I by shouldn't. the way tip tip of the cap uh, put your hand up take accountability i'm glad that he apologized for yeah, that. yeah, wrong. yeah. You know, listen we we can give him that with that that same estimation of like people at a certain you know uh era and cer certain you know uh Sucks. age just that's how they talk they don't necessarily mean nefarious things about it but whatever he came out and he said i'm sorry whatever took a lot of flack from the right for doing that which is ridiculous but you hear trump when they talk about the an people being animals uh who are coming to this country he tells you that he's an, he's not supposed to speak like that and then yeah. speaks okay. like that so it tells you a couple different things that a he listens he hears all the criticism he knows the things he knows that it's a uh a really problematic term to, uh, or ideology to, to view people that way and then he he basks in the glory of then turning people on to that. And that's the biggest issue. And then when you speak and speaking of the people that are at his rallies and they ask, uh, why don't you like Biden? He's a pedophile. He uh, he's a bit the biggest liar. He's the biggest crook. He's the biggest, um, you know, he's uh, completely compromised. All these things that Trump is right. They just heap it on someone like Biden, who is, you know, willing to admit mistakes, 
willing to sort of say, my, I'm, I'm sorry for that. I, I don't want to, you know, offend people for using derogatory terms. And it's like, but it's all the same playing field now. Well, I, I, I agree that that was good of Biden to put his hand up for accountability on that one and correct himself. On the other hand, I mean, the, the stubbornness is legendary. I mean, he, he was down at a fundraiser being told that Michigan and Georgia was pissed off at him about not just Gaza, but also voting rights. And he screamed at him. So, I mean, I, it's, 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 it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, uh, to continue with the Trump story, Nick, is this thing. And by the way, the rhetoric's only going to get worse as his life gets worse. That's the whole point. Like this, we're, we're in March. Like this election, last I checked, is until November. It's going to get worse. His uh, economic situation has gotten much, much, much worse as uh, he has been unable to find the bond for his $450 million plus uh, judgment in New York. He's been turned down by over 30 companies in terms of trying to get that bond. Uh, now New York State is discussing seizing his assets, uh, which will be an absolute shit show a state seizing his assets while also going through a presidential election. The good news, Nick, is that he's bringing in old buddy, friend of the pod, Paul Manafort, uh, to take care of the Republican National Convention this summer. Um, I'm just saying for no reason whatsoever, and not that this is at all linked to this story, but Paul Manafort, according to my notes, uh, is a convicted felon for fraud and money laundering. I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't know what that has to do with any of this, but moving forward. Man, listen, the, the articles written about the, his inability to get the bond doesn't mention Manafort at all. You can nope. do a search for his name. So whatever you're saying, man, can't possibly be related because it's not being reported that way. If you want to try and make crazy connections, what else are you going to do, Jared? You're going to try and make it sound like... Um, <laughs> Are you going to start in with this stuff that Donald Trump has concerning ties to oligarchs and criminals in Russia? Is that what this is? Because if that's what I'm just going to have to step away, that is just wild shit. Yes, here it comes. Uh, but um, I mean, listen, if I wanted to follow that train of thought, of which I can easily do because I have a predilection for some versions of. Uh, well, also, Nick, because you follow reality. I follow reality, yes, and I and I, you know, I, I can parse the different conspiracies and, and what, which one, what are the good ones, but um, so he needs a lot of money. Manafort's the guy who's got all the connections to all the Russian money they want to launder, so they can kind of all, you know, watch each other's backs, I suppose, in a disgusting image uh, that I really wish I hadn't said, but you know, th I suppose that is where you're going with this. Somehow he will all of a sudden have the, uh, the $435 million he needs for the bond and it won't be an insurance company backing this. It'll be some uh, infusion of cash he found. Some somebody just absolutely swimming in an ocean of blood money. I also love, by the way, because this is how this whole thing works. I love that Jared Kushner, who's already cashed in on God knows how many billions of dollars of deals, is now going ahead and carrying out a deal in Serbia that Trump wanted to do himself just because he got an inkling. It has nothing to do with him doing it on behalf of uh, a former president who has basically been enjoying legal bribery. Um it, it it's so gross nick and it's so so bad and this thing i mean the situation is getting worse but at the same time i don't even think he's actually going to be held accountable in pretty much any way possible because the system's not going to do it and you can get money to this guy because there's a real possibility he not only is the former president of the united states who has a ton of national secrets that that he knows that he's probably well allegedly already sold off and handed out but like he's he's right now if not the front runner he's a toss-up to be the next president of the united states the no one's gonna let him like twist on the line no uh and i think it's you know the downfall of uh of journalism as well right like there's just there's a lack of accountability across the board here um yep. i'm trying to look for the the tweet i i had found earlier because it's almost like everybody's in on this Right. I feel like everybody across the, the uh, of politics on both sides is sort of in on what, you know, behind the curtain of what how corrupt all these things can be. And so it's just frustrating, you know, because we also feel that way. And there used to be kind of a joke. Oh, it's you know, all politicians are crooked, whatever. But it's it, it sort of makes it OK then. Well, you know, here's the thing. We talk about it because we have nothing to lose. 
Like we and, and and let's be very frank about that. I don't think people understand it. There aren't that many journalists and voices out there who talk about this shit and put two and two together to equal four because they 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 want to be seen as quote unquote respectable. They want to get hired to places like the New York Times. They want to get hired into podcast networks or whatever. The reason why we're not afraid to actually like put together the numbers that equal the number is because like there there there's no consequence for it. Like we don't need to go. To, I'm sorry. We're going to Henderson, Nevada for a podcast stand up jam. Like we're not going to like a Washington, D.C. Beltway, you know, drink after party. I'm not interested in that. I, I don't know about you. You live in Los Angeles. You might be interested in a soiree like that. I, I know I can't drink um, um, whiskey. So, well, well, it wouldn't have to be whiskey. You could have a Oh, I'm Cosmo, do you drink that those kind of? What things. do you have? What What would you drink if you were in a fancy cocktail party? Oh, red wine. Okay, well, I mean, it's not a cocktail, but yeah, you'd oh. be fine. But <laughs> you don't want to hobnob with Mitch McConnell. No, I don't. Please don't make me. Jared. That's what I'm Please. saying. The people who don't want to talk about this and actually just connect the dots the way that they are obviously there, they don't want to get those invites taken away, Nick. That's the yeah, deal. Hey, hey, but do we? Maybe I do want to do that though. I don't know. Do I want to be do, like? Would it be a chance to like actually talk to Mitch McConnell and like somehow figure something out about him and and, and maybe make a point to him? And that's the way not what happened. Do you do you think that Mitch McConnell takes his takes his barrier down? I mean that that man's not even like functioning at this point. All right, fair enough. I don't know. Yeah, but no, no, they're, they're, it's all bullshit. They're all like continuing to play the game. Which, by the way, uh, now that I'm looking at the notes in our. <laughs> like our show that's like the through line on this thing oh well I, just, I wanted to share one thing because you know when we talked about boeing last week i, I kind of forgot that somehow this, this passed my mind but um I, I you know there's a uh a tweet that came out from a from a reporter where congressman william keating appears to have sold boeing stock on february 28th when the dog and a doj announced it was investigating them on the 29th um that happens all the time as well right and i just kind of felt like um how would he have known to sell a whole shitload of Boeing stock before it was announced that they're going to be in, uh, investigated? If you're in, Listen, I'm going right. to ruffle feathers. I mean, that's how Nancy Pelosi has basically made her modern fortune. You know what I mean? Like that, 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 that's how that whole thing works. Like it should be completely and utterly illegal, but these people are playing a game and we're not invited to that game. I mean, everybody... hmm? just, make, just, make, just to make it clear, it is legal what he did. Well, I mean, sure. I suppose shouldn't be, but like everybody knows that Trump is going to get anything that he ends up paying. He's not paying. Right. He's going to steal it from the Republican national convention. He's going to fleece his supporters. And on top of that, he's going to use someone like a Paul Manafort or a go between to get God knows how much blood money and dirt money basically from, uh, from Europe is what's going to happen. He's going to get it from Russia, the dirty parts of Ukraine or wherever else he can get it. And and probably the Saudis while we're at it. Well, let's, let's, let's get into, I, I really hate to do this, but let's get into the Trump's mind for a second here. Cause I'm kind of okay. curious how he got to the point where, okay, Paul Manafort, we know his, all of his transgressions. Did he serve prison time recently? I sort of, sort of, <laughs> yes. You know, and has he been embroiled in the most ridiculous scandal and like tainted beyond belief? Yeah. He so, was part of one of the largest scandals in American history that the media actually covered and then apologized for, more or less. Yeah, and you know, and yeah. and he was uh, exon or not exonerated. He was uh, I, I, he got a pardon, right? Trump pardoned him, or no? Know? He got out because of COVID. Ah, okay. So here's the point: like all that's a lot of baggage, right? A lot of baggage around him that he's carrying around. Barely, he couldn't. They don't care. <laughs> and, and all the people that they could figure out, like maybe to do back channels to Russia or whatever to get more money, like why? Why does it have to be this guy? Like they're just inviting it again and all the scrutiny and all the, you know, you know that the CIA and the FBI are probably like perked up a little bit in their chairs as soon as they realize he's going to be back. I it's had a con I had a conversation. It was back in 2016, Nick. And it was when Manafort took over Trump's campaign. And I was talking to one of my old uh, media acquaintances and, you know, they didn't think much of uh, Manafort taking over the campaign. Manafort hadn't played a major role since like Gerald Ford, you know, like he had no idea what was going on. And suddenly he was in charge of like a, a, a presidential campaign, a real one. And I just said, 
why would he be in charge? And the person just kind of like looked at me and they were like, I don't have an answer for that other than what the obvious answer is, which is that he was a direct link to Russia and a money man between the blood money of Russia, Ukraine, and those parts of Europe and Donald Trump's entire operation. That was it. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew it. No one reported it. Then he got caught with all of his shit from Ukraine and his money laundering and nobody connected the dots, Nick. They had the entire story that he was running a go-between, basically, from Russia to the Trump campaign, and nobody really wanted to talk about it because everyone's in denial about what's been going on. And it's very obvious how this whole thing has worked. And they don't care. They'll bring it back. They'll run it back. They're not worried about it. Do, do you think that, um, you, you know, the, the Russia connection to Trump was seen to be pretty strong before Manafort became involved in the campaign? So do you think that it was... Russia just said, you put in him, He's, you put Manafort in. Like, Is that he, your Russian? That, that's something. I thought that was pretty good. I don't okay. Know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, do you think that they, they, they made, you know, because obviously they, you know, Trump needs all their money anyway when he was helping them launder their money before 2016. So do you think that they just, they installed Manafort because they needed all the data for the elections and all that kind of stuff? No, I think it's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Nobody wanted to work with Trump. Manafort came in and said, I'll do this for free. Trump's like that. The price is right. And he's like, by the way, uh, I've also got some other things I could do for you. Okay. And I, I think those were all put in the same sort of place. All right. Because it's just helping me wrap my head around how we get back again to hear if it's not like Putin or whoever is saying, OK, you put it, you, you know, people we need really, back. truly still want to believe that Vladimir Putin is a puppet master who's controlling Donald Trump. That's not how this stuff works. They're on the same team. They're on the same wavelength. Putin is doing all this stuff. They're doing all this stuff over there. It's like a pack and a, and a candidate. You know what I mean? Like they 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 don't have all that much direct communication. It's not like the 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 P tape is out there like everybody was hoping for for a very long right. time. Now, like, everybody wants it to be like movie of the week or movie the movie of the month, but it's still treasonous activity. It's still that that's the whole point of it, which is unfortunately what we've missed out on. Speaking of people um, who have absolutely no scruples whatsoever, Nick, a report has come out that a confidential classified contract has been put in place between the United States government and Elon Musk and his SpaceX program to pay $1.8 billion. That's right. B with a billion, $1.8 billion, so that Elon Musk and SpaceX will create a vast spy satellite system, a, a new age, top of the line, almost indescribable spy satellite system, supposedly to give the United States an edge. According to one insider in the project, quote, no one can hide from this project. Um, Nick, I, I, I want to talk about this and its implications and sort of put this into context for other people. Am I wrong? Like, did I suffer like some sort of an injury? Isn't Elon Musk like basically at this point an avowed anti-Semite who is spreading conspiracy theories, including white replacement theory and trying to get things like birth control made illegal? Am I wrong here? No, you are not wrong. Oh, okay. And by the way, when you say no one can hide, I think what you mean is like th this satellite system will be able to see yes. everybody anywhere they go is what you're yes. saying. Yes. Yeah. It's we, I, you know, and I've been waiting for real genius to finally become a real, you know, documentary. And here we are, because again, how far fetched would it be to, okay, hey, can one of these satellites, you know, shoot a laser beam in, in a direct target and kill somebody for us? So that'd, be, that'd be nice. It'd save us some time. Um, you know, uh, the, but the other more, the more pressing problem to me is what you said as far as, um, the connection that Musk has to Russia is 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 concerning to me. Who and, he has to yeah, everybody, China yeah. to the Saudis to to Russia, you name it. There's and he's no already been accused of you know in, intervening to some degree in the Russia oh. conflict with uh, Ukraine. Nick, so, can you put that into context for people? What he has already done with his Starlink satellites. Yeah, well, he he literally saved the third fleet of the Russian whatever I don't know what it's called because the UK was about to destroy it and you know they're all like Pearl Harbor or whatever and he turned off the Starlink. Wait, 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 Nick, when you say it like that, it doesn't sound good. It doesn't. It's not good, Bob. Not so the all. guy, the guy who literally and by the way, is it the position of the United States that Ukraine should win their war against Russia? Yes. Okay, and so the main defense contractor that the United, well, I mean, the, the one main individual that they rely on, are you telling me that he solely, without any sort of input from anybody else, that he made a decision that he was going to turn off his satellites in order to run counter to the United States military position? I'm telling you that. 
Wait, did that happen before any of this? Yes. Yes, and more. That's incredible when you say it out loud. Incredible. And so, you know, and, and he kind of has wavered back and forth because then he did, you know, he, he he has helped Ukraine. But again, it's only because uh, the United States has given him billions more dollars for that, you know, to, to, to get that contract done. So he'll do, OK, I'll, I'll help them out, too, if you give me enough money. And here we are with this. It's such a um, when we're talking about spy satellites now, you know, I, I don't know. This must be the residual of 9-11. Right. And and the Patriot Act and, and the the. the Maybe I don't know if we care anymore, but there's certain there's a certain sense of, you know, oh, well, everyone sees what we're doing anyway, you know, and like, you know, even our um, the our, our wireless routers are being monitored by China or whatever. Right. So it's like at this point, I, I don't know if anybody still has that same, um, you know, uh, revulsion to spying on you and being too much in your business. I hope I wish we they were still. They, they should. <laughs> they, they should still feel bad about that. Um, the one thing I said, you know, when he took over Twitter and obviously turned it into a right wing hate conspiracy machine is that uh, he then not only had access to people's DMs, he also had access to their cookies and also the, the tracking of where they went online. Um, those who don't think about it very much, the Internet is the unconscious made conscious. It's, it's what you think about, what you're th- what you're thinking about things. It's basically a map of your thoughts, you know, put into a digital space uh, because of the cookies of a website. They probably have access to all of that. Now, all of a sudden, we're talking about handing this over to a guy who's basically a, a supervillain at this point. Like, yeah. like, a, like an absolute creep of a white supremacist conspiracy theorist. Also, Nick, I, you know what I didn't even bring up? Like how often now he's attacking the literal definition of democracy, how mm-hmm. we probably shouldn't have votes the way that we used to have it. Also, DEI, like going after like minorities and saying that they're not as smart and or, you know, as talented as other people and they're only being chosen, you know, racism uh, and misogyny for that matter. This guy is continuing to be shoveled. And for those who think this is the first time, SpaceX has received over 15 billion with a B dollars from the United States because we needed to privatize everything. And as a result, we're relying on this space idiot to take over our entire space program. We have made Elon Musk a load bearing wall in the administrative state. It doesn't matter what he says. It doesn't even begin to matter what he says, what his political positions are, any of it. And you are literally asking this person who spreads conspiracy theories, who is an anti-democratic person, who is in bed with the Chinese, with the Saudis, with the Russians, and God knows who, Nick. God knows who. This is what happens in late stage privatization is the United States government relies on somebody like this. It doesn't matter what they do, what they say. They have to rely on the technology because they don't have it. And there are multiple tech uh, companies and individuals that they have to do this with. It literally doesn't matter because they will they will just absolutely betray every principle that supposedly they hold in order to gain more power in what they think is the geopolitical game. Well, are we still talking about Trump? I mean, well, sorry, geez, about Musk and um, and, and can we keep fleshing out who he is? Is that what, is that the section of the show? Sure, an awful person, by the way. I mean, I mean, I, listen, I watched chunks of the Don Lemon interview with him, so you oh. didn't have to. Um, but what was illuminating to me was that when he, when uh, Don Lemon, you know, confronted him with so much hate speech on his platform. Um, he says, aren't you concerned about this? Shouldn't this all be taken down? And, you know, the way his uh, Musk's thought process goes, he gets kind of intractable very quickly and kind of doesn't can't get beyond like whatever the sentence is that's repeating in his head. He goes. So he thinks that moderation and, and I don't mean by moderation, like eating less. I mean, moderation, like, you know, moderating your comments section um, is, is basically censorship. Right. He can't get beyond that notion. But Lemon's like, well, you have rules on your platform that that says you cannot have hate speech and he shows them what you know what's on there and it's some of the most awful anti-semitic you know images you can imagine and he kind of doesn't want to look at it and kind of just says well you know who's to decide what is hate speech or not it's it's censorship and you want censorship and then he thinks he gets clever by trying to turn it on the lemon and say well you want censorship and i want free speech the free speech thing i you know what i guess it's the first two amendments are really a fucking problem for us now 
because <laughs> the free speech ends up encompassing everything, right? Whether it's misinformation or, or, or information that would kill you. Yep and your health. Uh, and then the second amendment is the other one where they think that they all deserve guns. You mix those two things together. I don't think that they thought about it when they were trying to get them ratified, but the first and second amendments are fucking problem and have been so bastardized and so manipulated here. I, that it, we, a, we should rewrite them anyway, because they're not clear uh, anymore what it means. And, and B the, the right, it's just, it's insane. The intellectual dishonesty, they'll, they'll, the lengths they'll go to to just manipulate those two things. It's really horrible. Well, first of all, I want to point out um, a little bit of context about the Don Lemon thing. For people who don't know, Don Lemon, who was fired from CNN, uh, was basically given a Tucker Carlson, not as big as Tucker Carlson, but a sweetheart deal from Elon Musk to do a show on uh, Twitter, X, whatever. Um, he was canceled before the first episode aired because he absolutely beat the brakes off of Elon Musk. <laughs> I mean, like Don Lemon did a journalism. And Elon Musk did not want a journalism. For those who don't follow it, and I follow it, unfortunately, closely, the people like your Tucker Carlson, your Alex Jones, your Andrew Tate, all the, just the worst of the worst, Nick, they, I mean, the bootlicking factory that they've put together for Elon Musk is absolutely incredible. And, and Don Lemon destroyed him in one single interview and was canceled. Um, on I, mean, the I, I take a little pleasure of watching the right because I, for some reason, my feed, of course, maybe everyone's like this on X now or on Twitter, is just right wing propaganda. It's all, I all get, it. right. And yeah. so, but I, so I do take pleasure. I'm like, okay, when they say, look how uh, Musk owns Don Lemon with this little clip, and then you watch it and you're like, geez, he he was Lemon actually was really good, and, and Musk didn't answer the question, and he was evasive and he was, you know, defensive, but like. They don't. They don't see it that way. Is it? Their, I guess it's their reality. They've colored it that way, and there's nothing that will penetrate what they feel. But it's like you know, I, I don't no, know. They're else. they're they're in a completely alternate reality at this point. And by the way, Musk is so paper thin and incompetent. It's incredible. And and more about that in a second or next segment. Nick, on the point of the First Amendment, I I just have to say. The problem isn't the First Amendment. The First Amendment is one of the best things that our founders ever possibly did. Theoretically, like you should be able to, up to a certain point, be able to say whatever you want. The problem is that because neoliberalism has created the environment that we have, that we have come to associate economic consequences with in, in like infringements on free speech. Like, like the idea that you should be able to say anything you want without any sort of an economic consequence, that's wild. That you shouldn't be canceled, that people shouldn't boycott you, that they shouldn't do whatever. What the right is actually wanting to do, and they're not serious about free speech, what they want, what they're saying when they want free speech is they want to rewire the economic and cultural and political systems in order to make it to where it's okay for them to say anything they want and nobody can punish them for it. So as a result, the First Amendment isn't even what we're discussing anymore. What we're talking about now are a bunch of interlocking, complicated socioeconomic factors. And that actually has nothing to do with free speech. You know, like what they're actually talking about at this point is 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 a absolute load of bullshit. Is I, what I, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that, that you know, there's got to be a component as well of just humanity that's lacking here. You yeah. know, because Levin will even say, it's like, don't you understand that this causes when we see the manifestos of you know violent perpetrators of horrible crimes, they reference these memes and these pictures and these social media stuff. The problem is that Don Lemon tried to meet him in good faith. He tried to say, oh, I thought you cared about these things. He doesn't care about these. He hasn't cared about free speech at any given point. The, and, and by the way, here's the thing. Uh, I think Don Lemon uh, has his moments. I don't think he's ready to have a big giant the theoretical in the weeds conversation with, with Elon Musk. Because in order to talk to Elon Musk and, and gain anything from it, you have to have a conversation about this stuff. He doesn't want free speech. He wants to change society and he wants to feel better. And by the way, one of the reasons, Nick, why he wants to uh, change society is what we have to talk about next. And once again, one of the greatest moments in the history of the Muckrake podcast, and I'll, I'll reference it in a second when it comes to Elon Musk. Sam Bankman Freed. Uh, who, of course, has been uh, speaking of Paul Manafort, he's been found guilty of defrauding uh, his investors with uh, his FTX Bitcoin scheme. Uh, he has been found uh, guilty. There's been a sentencing memo that has come out with a bunch of findings uh, in order to influencing that that uh, sentencing. And Nick, within 
this uh, this document, there have been notes from Sam Bankman Fried that have been found. And a reminder that he is uh, famously one of the top donors for the Democrats, or has been, that based on the scandal that was erupting around the collapse of FTX and his crimes being discovered, he was considering, quote, going on Tucker Carlson and coming out as a Republican and coming out against the woke agenda. Um, this, I think, is really telling of a lot of different things, but I want to remind people of one of the best moments in Muckrake podcast history, which was when we found out that Elon Musk had been accused of a bunch of sexual improprieties. And what did you say? You said immediately, I bet in the next couple of days he comes out as anti-woke. And by the way, before the show had even published, it happened. And 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 I mean, it, it. we had gotten done taping. I had gone to have a drink and a, and a bite at a bar. And we, I had to come back and do like an emergency podcast update because you had nailed it so dead to the wall. And here we have it again because they these guys, Bankman Freed, Elon Musk, all these people, they understand the political environment really, really well. And they understand that it really doesn't matter what you believe or what you want. What matters is playing a certain part at this point. Right. Well, I think what matters is if you embrace the anti-woke side and the, and the right wing side of things, you can then uh, say that whatever's reality is, is lies. That's, well, it's, it's, real fast, Bankman Freed and Elon Musk were happy liberals for a long time. Mm -hmm. Sam Bankman Freed was the number one donor of the Democrats. By the way, everybody, he gave just as much to Republicans, which we'll get to later. Elon Musk was the darling of liberals, right? Logic and technology are going to save the day. No, and, like you, and what are the advantages of going, quote unquote, anti-woke, Nick? Yeah, you, you basically get to then um, in a public way and in a way where you can elicit sympathy, you can then just unleash any amount of lies you want about the whole system. And because you're using the certain keywords, the everyone the, the, that section of the country just comes out and is like is behind you immediately. And uh, we could do that as well, Jared. We could start doing that tomorrow. And probably we, we would probably have a, we, could we have a bigger audience if we did that? Maybe. I OK, so let's go ahead and talk about this. I think about this a lot, which is if I if I reached out to like let's say an Alex Jones, right? And I and I reached out to Alex Jones and I said, Hey, I know that I'm like a leftist firebrand. I do all this stuff. I'm like out there debunking conspiracy theories. I need to tell you the truth about something. I've seen the light and you wouldn't believe the conversations I've had. Would I be on would I be on InfoWars within twenty four hours? Yeah, I think I think you would. Would I be would I be on Fox News probably within 48 hours? Yeah, they would love that. They would love that shit, man. They would be so ready to go. These are decisions that people are making from a purely cynical background. And you're right. Saying that you're anti-woke or going coming out as a Republican basically says you the media doesn't have shit on me. And everybody who's going to buy your product or support you, they don't care. They don't care if you assaulted someone. They don't care if you abused somebody. They don't care if you like, you know, ripped a bunch of people off. In fact, they'll celebrate it. Andrew Tate is under investigation for human trafficking, Nick. Human trafficking, which is what all these people are supposed to care about. But they don't care. It's professional wrestling. What this is for Sam Bankman Freed, he was thinking about a heel turn. He was thinking about becoming a bad guy and people love a bad guy on that side of the road. And that's all that matters. I mean, listen, I, I, I feel I only feel bad in some respects because this is not supposed to have been leaked. This is, I think, a mistake by the lawyers. Right. They had out of discovery. This this document. Out got out there. Yeah. And, you know, if I were spitballing, you know, it, it, looking at my future thinking, I'm going to spend 50 years in jail now. Let's spitball here and figure out what can I do to get out of this? I'd be writing all sorts of crazy shit in the, on that list. And so I, I kind of feel bad because it's like that's sort of what happened here. But again, that isn't the point either. The point is what you said is that this is this is the the reveal. Like this is what you would do. And that would it probably have been if the goal was to try and get more public sympathy and perhaps muck up the whole process. That was exactly what you would need to do. Uh, and um, and, and I, I guess the only credit to him is that he didn't do that. Right? I don't know. Why, I don't know why I kept him from doing it, but. Nick, while we're on the subject, because it wouldn't be the Muckrake podcast if we didn't bring it up, 
man, it's bullshit that the Democrats like lifted this guy up as a hero for so long. Like, I mean, you had Bill Clinton and Tony Blair sitting with this guy in cargo, uh, you know, shorts being like, how do you do it, man? In the exact same way that they kept making googly eyes at Zuckerberg and Elon Musk. And listen, people need to remember this shit. These people were raised up on high by the Democrats because they wanted to believe that they were on their side and the Silicon Valley people were on their side. And all they did is they gave them the keys to the government. As we talked about with Elon Musk a second ago, they made them indispensable. They made them multi, multi, multi historical billionaires. And in the process, all they did was just like raise up on high a bunch of incompetent people who are not just cynical, but sociopathic in their political and cultural dealings. Well, well, here's an interesting problem, right? Because, you know, Bank Griffey was saying all the right things. He sounded very progressive. He was giving a lot of money that, you know, I guess he didn't have uh, to, the, to the cause. Um, do they are they supposed to vet? I, I guess I guess when you get to a certain level of political power, you do. Right. You can't afford to go to like you shouldn't be going to dinner with like a white supremacist, for instance. Right. That would you shouldn't be doing that. Or, Nick, if you if, if you'll indulge me for just a second. Bill Clinton, who ends up on a stage with Sam Bankman Freed, is the same Bill Clinton who ends up on a flight with Jeffrey Epstein. And I'm sorry, but let's be very clear about this. One, you shouldn't be on a flight with Jeffrey Epstein. Two, the best defense you have is that Bill Clinton didn't know about it. Shouldn't he know? Mm -hmm. This was an open secret in Washington, D.C. and New York City. So as a result, yes, you should research these people before you're appearing in public with Tony Blair or before you end up on the Lolita Express. Like, yes, you should know better than this. Fair enough. So like the aide would be like, you know, this guy is really great. He seems great, but we are, we do hear a lot of whispers that this is probably a pyramid scheme. So maybe you should pass on appearing with him and yada, yada. I mean, I, I, right. That's what they, they had the people there for. So uh, it's Nick, look how many people got roped into the, the pyramid scheme of crypto. And I don't just mean people buying Bitcoin or whatever. I'm talking about like big name celebrities and actors and athletes and politicians who were doing commercials for it, who were talking about it like it was the future. Like those people, shouldn't they have known better? No, they were getting paid in the same way. Nick, we've talked about like the Saudis. How do they keep getting people when they're they're cold-blooded killers, when they're just absolute psychopaths? How do they keep getting people to like do what they want them to do? They just flood them with cash. And and everybody is for sale at that point. I mean, it, it really shows like the rotten moral co uh, core of all this stuff. I, I do feel compelled to tell you that when Bitcoin first, like around 2021, everyone's like, this is a sham, whatever, and it went down. If you had held on to your Bitcoin until today. Good luck, everyone. Yeah. Good, good luck. In your money. Good luck. I, I have enjoyed sitting at a roulette wheel myself every now and then, as I've talked about on this. I time. played crafts, by the way, not long ago for the Did first you? time ever. Okay. Well, I mean, we're going to Vegas. Maybe we could. Maybe we'll... I mean, I could, I could now almost do it and not be so completely brain frozen because I was, it was so, have you ever played crafts before? No, no interest. It's like. It's 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 overwhelming. Nick, I'm overwhelming. Nick, I, I about said I'm neurodivergent, but I think anyone who's paid attention to the show knows that you and I are both neurodivergent. <laughs> like, so yeah. it, it's overwhelming for me. That's my particular type of neurodivergent. Well, I mean, the pressure because everyone's like they have their own money on whatever. And I, I, you have to roll oh, and you have to get the dice to hit the wall all the way on the other side. Yeah. And I was really worried I was going to throw it and go off the mm. table. And my my best friend next to me didn't tell me what he should have earlier was like hey it's okay if it goes off the table people do it all the time oh yeah all so i was like getting stuck in between i wasn't rolling all the way and then the guy who was running the pits like sir you must throw it has in. and I, I i was losing my mind i couldn't handle oh, it was no. just money and whatever so i did not like it that was the problem but it was probably as well as, um how about this in in in, in vegas you and i maybe we'll bet on a basketball game i think that's yeah. that's we could do that well listen blackjack's fun yeah, we can look into blackjack from uh, something lighthearted, including just the buffoonery of all this stuff. Something very, very serious that we need to talk about. Um, Haiti is uh, descending into chaos. Unfortunately, uh, Prime Minister Ariel Henry has resigned as chaos has just grown and grown and grown. Currently, gangs and militias and warlords are battling over power in the streets. Uh, it's widespread violence, uh, a lot of a lot of tragedy um, already. 
uh, it appears that this is going to turn into a situation that could have major ramifications for American politics, including the 2024 election, in which refugees from the violence might come to the United States. The United States might have to make some decisions about what it's going to do about this situation. Um, what what are your initial thoughts about this? Because I, I want to talk about the historical context and what I see coming down the road. I mean, I, when my mind tends to drift on these things. It's like, okay, what is the solution? How would you ever get this back under, you know, some sort of control? And I don't, I don't know how you would do this because the circumstances for which the last guy in charge got killed was insane, uh, and and felt like there was all sorts of weird collusion across other countries. And it's just very, very like a, it could be a movie. Um, and it it really is. Um, I, I don't know. Like like even like never went in New York the subways when they they wanted to put the National Guard in the subways or they were doing that because it was yep. big. Moment. And by the way, we subsequently saw something an absolute horrible horrific tragedy happen after that. Um, it's like at some point you're like, listen, if whatever you can do to figure out to get like some version of order restored and some safety for innocent people. But I don't know if you mentioned this, but like they're, they're breaking in all the prisons and, and getting people in the oh, prison. Yeah. You know, breaking them that's out. What happened? I mean, to be to be frank, that's what happens when a regime falls: is you 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 go in and release the people from prison. Yeah. So it, it's it's it, it's going to be something military, and it's, I, it, I don't I don't I can't even understand how that would be and who's going to contribute to do this. But uh, it's it is just a uh, awful, and I, I I my heart goes out to everybody who lives there who is just trying to live their lives. Yeah. Um, before we get into the modern context, I want to give it a little bit of historical background. Um, Haiti is a white supremacist dream in terms of how it's it's treated. Uh, it's treated as like, look what happens when when black people are in power. You know, like, oh, it's so sad and so tragic. And as a result, the United States has gone in and plundered them multiple times, taken over. I mean, um, I can't imagine the United States in an election year sending troops into to Haiti. I, I have a really hard time believing that's going to happen. But I mean, stranger things have happened and we'll talk about the consequences later. That white supremacist like framing, though, is completely and utterly wrong. Um, they want to believe that either Haiti is somehow or another racially or culturally inferior. Uh, there's even some evangelicals that believe that Haiti's troubles has uh, originated from a deal with the devil that took place, uh, you know, back in the 18th century. Uh, but what actually has happened with Haiti? And for people who don't know, uh, Haiti won uh, its independence back in the early, early 19th century with the Haitian Revolution. Uh, this happened after the French Revolution. And the Haitians said, hey, the French are saying that all men are created equal and there should be, you know, like more power to the people. They believed them. And so as a result, they overthrew their slavers. Uh, and then they had to fight a war against Napoleonic France. Are you ready for this, Nick? Mm -hmm. They won. Yeah. Then they had to fight Spain. Then they had to fight the United Kingdom and they won. Somehow or another, they were able to manage to win their independence against the largest powers of Western civilization, these so-called like white saviors. They defeated each of them and ended up getting their independence. But guess what? France came along with the entire United Might of the world and said, hey, that's great. You guys are free now. You're going to have to pay for yourselves. So for years and years and years and years, they had to pay unfair reparations that wounded and, and destroyed their entire economy. And then we kept going in and messing with them because our banks and corporations wanted to exploit them. And what did we do, Nick? Like other nations in the global South that we now blame for their refugees and their immigrants, we kept them unstable and we kept them under our control and our thumb. So now we've reached another point with this. Here's the problem, Nick. The things that happen in Haiti have a weird effect on America, and they always have. Immediately after the Haitian Revolution, the United States government was like, what are we going to do about this, like, you know, black-led independent state nearby? Uh, George Washington was incredibly racist against them. The Federalists were as well. Uh, there was also a fear among so Southern slavers that the revolution was going to spread to the South. That is one of the reasons that they were so paranoid about not just slave uprisings, but also the abolition movement. Mm -hmm. So as a result, almost like the moon affects the tides, Haiti affects America and the white supremacist sort of underpinnings of all this stuff. There's a real possibility we're going to have to have a lot of refugees come over from this. This is going to become one of the topic du jours of uh, Fox News, Donald Trump, the Republican Party. If this continues, this is going to become one of the major conversations and white fear mongerings of this entire thing. 
I think this could be the beginning of a very, very large story going forward. And I don't know what's going to happen. I'm with you. I, I wish peace would settle in and they could have something of domestic tra- tra- tranquility, but we haven't given them the, the, the possibility for that so far. Right. And, and you can easily see like Biden's advisors saying, listen, yeah, it's an election year. We do not want to get involved in this at all. Yeah. Let them, you know, we'll figure it out after we win. But like the humanitarian thing to do would be, you know, a, an international coalition of several countries go in there as a peacekeeping force and try and get order and, and you know, try and get things uh, back in working condition there ASAP. Right. And limit the violence and limit the, you know, all the horrible things that are going to happen there. Uh, but, yeah, I don't I don't have any faith that that will happen at all. Um, and we, you know, it, it, immigration is just another horrible um, hot button issue here that they, people want to use whatever their own nefarious means. You know, and I like, you know, the, the notion of the debt that they were saddled with over multiple decades from France is just like you'd see from descendants of slaves here, you know, who they the crippling debt that they were placed under after becoming free after the Civil War is lasted till now. You know, no, like, it was it was it was economic it was economic subjugation is what it absolutely was. Same way, like you know, you you were freed from slavery, and as a result, you had Jim Crow. You know, like I, it, it just yeah. Or, it's or you had sheriffs that suddenly sprouted up and started arresting people, and you know, yep. basically made them slaves again anyway. Made, so. it, made it made them servants. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's 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 a really awful situation. It's tragic the way that Haiti has been positioned and treated for all these, uh, not just years, I mean, now, now centuries. Um, it, it's absolutely awful. It, it, on one hand, it would be great if this thing got itself figured out and people could live in, you know, uh, safety, but also like this, if it continues, it's going to end up becoming like a major, major issue. And it's got just tons of ramifications that, that could take place. And like you said, when it comes to like a Biden or a sitting president, like being an incumbent in times like these is never a strength. It just isn't. And so you're right. Like you have a, you might end up having a situation. Are you going to send in U.S. troops and risk having U.S. troops die because they go into Haiti to take care of something? Or do you let the situation get worse and you suddenly have, you know, a, an immigration refugee crisis? They'll hit you with that. It's a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. I don't know if it's necessarily going to turn into that type of an issue, but I'm saying that it has all the potential to become that. And we should also, you know, while we're talking about politics and consequences, we should just, like you said, we should pay attention to the human suffering that's taking place here. And and it's awful that these people are having to go through this. I mean, listen, we can go over to Puerto Rico next door as well and discuss, you know, how the conditions there that have never been. They should be a state, first of all. That, that, that should just be it, right? But, you know, it is what it is. So, all right, everybody, on that note, we're going to take off, but we are going to be back. A reminder, the Weekender will not come out on Friday. It will come out Saturday after our live recording at the Stand Up Pod Jam in uh, Nevada, Henderson, Nevada. Uh, Reminder, you can still get tickets for that. You can find it in our show notes. We hope to see you and hang out with you. Um, Thank you again for all of your support. We're looking forward to to seeing you down there. Uh, And thank you uh, for subscribing and becoming patrons. If you haven't already, go to patreon.com slash podcast to gain access to that and other exclusive shows. Keep us growing and uh, editorially independent as we were talking about. All right, everybody. In the meantime, you can find Nick at Can You Hear Me? You can find me at Jay West Be safe, everyone.